Good morning, and thank you for worshiping with us today. Please continue to support our ministry online through our website, the WBC app, or you can drop your offering off at the church Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. or Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Today's word is a pre-recorded sermon from our senior pastor, Dr. Delvin Atchison.
has set encampments around me. It is well. The God who covers angels on me has set encampments around. served on the city council in Hearn, Texas, and if you ever get to go to Hearn, go by uh, City Hall, and you'll see my name there on the City Hall. Um, I, I paid just that many tickets there, and they, you know, I was on the council. I wasn't a teenager then. I was a little bit older, Brother Ray, a little bit older. So you know enough about me. Let me tell you something about Jesus. Amen. Man, I'm grateful tonight for the presence of my wife. On last evening, she was babysitting and couldn't come. I, I always preach better when she is there. Uh, Dr. Seuss said about, uh, had to be talking about her when he said, it's getting harder for me to sleep because my reality is better than my dreams. Don't hate the player, y'all. Your boy trying to show y'all how to keep the house happy, amen. <laughs> and it is a joy. Let me say this, and I'll, and I'll be about my task at hand. Uh, whatever else we do as believers, it is the point of worship. You know, we keep trying to come up with ways to grow churches and develop people and, and how to get people involved. A ain't no other way to get involved in the church, but you gotta fall in love with Jesus. And worship is reflective of that. So Dr. Bradley, I thank you. And for Brittany, thank you so much for what an incredible gift. I'm gonna have to have a little talk with Patrick. This is the second night in a row he's brought a singer out here who cannot preach me, amen. <laughs> now, this is a little pastoral pick. 
and then I'm going to go on and preach as a guest evangelist. As an interim pastor, it's so good to see some of you on Wednesday. I didn't even know you knew where the church was on Wednesday. That's an interim pastor pick. Now for the task at hand, a few scattered remarks and I will bid you good evening. I think one of the biggest problems with, with those of us who are Christians is that we really don't understand biblical man. And we really don't know how to count. You know, it's interesting that the Bible has its own accounting system because the Bible says that there are certain things that we will count as liabilities that really ought to be assets. You, you, you look like you don't believe me. That's what James was talking about in James 1 when he says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. James is trying to get us to see something, and I'll read the scripture in a minute, but James is trying to get us to see that whatever you face in life, that your outlook has an effect on your outcome. And that if you don't start out with the right outlook, you will end up with the wrong outcome. And James would have us to understand that the reality in life is that all of us have experiences, but your experiences have to be filtered through your faith. And when you have the right outlook, it will determine your outcome. All James is trying to get us to see, and I'm going to read that scripture in a minute, is that today, somewhere in the world, two different people stood in front of men with knives or women with knives. One was being robbed, they were being assaulted, and the end was detrimental. But somebody stood before a surgeon with a scalpel, and the end, even though the cut was painful, the end meant that they were able to be healed. So that James would suggest to us that if you're going to face trials in life, you've got to understand that God is not the scoundrel trying to rob you, he's the surgeon trying to heal you. And so for a few minutes tonight, I want to help us with our arithmetic. I want to try to teach you how to count. Look at what James says in James, the first chapter. James, the first chapter, verses 1 through 5. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. The grass withers and the flowers thereof fadeth away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to talk about learning how to count. Learning how to count. James is the younger brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is interesting that when James introduces himself, he does not refer to his relationship to Jesus. He merely calls himself a servant of God and of Jesus Christ. Could it be that James would have us understand that what's significant in his life is not his physical relationship to Jesus, but his spiritual relationship to Jesus? James, a servant of Jesus Christ, he writes this letter to the Jews, and he uses this term, who are dispersed, scattered, the diaspora, those who are outside Palestine, those who have encountered struggles and now have spread abroad, he says to them, greeting. He begins this letter by saying, count it all joy. Now, this is an accounting term. It says that you determine what you're going through and you determine what side to put it on. That whether you're going to put it on the positive side or a negative side. Now, James would have us to understand something about all of our struggles. He says about three things in this text. I'd like to share them with you and then I'll take my seat. Would you like to hear them? Yes, sir. I'm glad that you 
would. The first thing that James does for us in the text, he says, now, it's important that you understand that our struggles will take a particular routine, that, that they have about them a particular routine. It's, it's right in the text. He says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. He says, now, the first thing you got to know about your struggles, about your tests, about your trials is that they are certain. He does not say if you fall. He does not say it may happen. He understands that if you're human, you're going to have some trials. You're going to have some tests. You're going to have some difficulty. And if you know it's going to happen, you ought not trip every time it happens. It ought not catch you by surprise. You ought not run around like this is the first time anybody in the history of anybody them has ever had a struggle. You are not the first. And to be honest, it's not the first time you've had one. He says, as sure as you are alive, it is certain. It's not just because you are a Christian. It is because you are human. All humans have to deal with trials. But then he just doesn't say they're certain. He says they are sudden. Watch the text. He says, when you fall, because a fall is something that happens quickly. Nobody with good sense goes outside and says, let me fall. And if they got good sense, not people with integrity. There are some folk who fall on purpose, but that's a whole nother sermon. That's a whole nother sermon. That's a whole nother sermon. And so what he says is that, notice what he says about them. He says they are certain, but they are sudden. He says that even if you don't plan for them, I remember growing up as a boy, the teacher would come into the room and the teacher would say to us, Clear your desk, take out a piece of paper, number from 1 to 10, get ready for a pop test. He says that life has a way just when you think you got everything all together, just when you think you got everything where it ought to be, just when you think got, you got being a Christian down. Child, I could be a Christian with my eyes closed. I got this thing together. Just when you paid all your stuff and you, you, you look like you're going to just have a little bit of money left, just when you can put your hands on all your family, he says that they have have a way of happening suddenly. He says, not by in the morning, but by the time tonight is over with. The family that you knew you had can be fractured. Your finances can be flattened. Your flesh can grow feeble and your friends will be few. He says that life has a way just when you got everything planned. Life will come into your room and say, clear your desk. Take out a piece of paper number from one to ten. I got a pop test for you. He says that, that, that they are certain. He says they are sudden, but then he says they are sorted. This word divers is the word we get diverse from. We get diversity from. He says you could handle tests if they only came from one direction. But he says time you get yourself ready over here, a test will tap you on this shoulder and say, I'm, I wish I had somebody. I mean, you don't spend all your time praying over your children and your children are fine. They are good. But you go to the doctor and the doctor say, I see a spot on an x-ray. I mean, you've been praying over your health, you've been eating right, you've been doing fine, and you get a call over in the middle of the night and says, there's been an accident, we need you. I don't need everybody, but I wish I had somebody here to testify that life has a way of hitting us with tests from all different directions. But I need to tell you something about these trials, that, and if you know the routine they're going to take, you may not be able to be ready for all of them, but, but you ought to at least know that they're coming and there are certain steps you ought to take. I remember talking to a father who was getting ready to bury his 28-year-old son. His name was Stephanie Chops, and I said to him, I called him Bo, I said, Bo, are you ready for tomorrow? He said, I ain't ready, but I am prepared. If you know that tests are coming your way, you ought to spend your life getting prepared because they are coming. The old preacher used to tell me, old man J.T. Harris, he would say, boy, how you doing? I said, I'm doing fine, Pop. He said, boy, you look like you ain't hit a bump in the road, but keep your shocks ready because they're coming. That's, that, that's what I've come to suggest to somebody here. If you know they're coming, and I need to tell you the interesting thing about my teachers when they gave us Pop tests, they would never cover on the quiz what they hadn't covered in class. 
I'm going to wait because somebody should have just, I mean, you just should have, I should have got an uh right through there. Right, right through there should have been an uh. Because I need to tell you that the one thing that God does is in times of comfort, in times of ease, God is preparing us. He's saying, get ready. That the time to prepare for war is in the time of peace. The time to prepare for the storm is in the time of the calm. And I need to tell you, you ought to be putting up some prayers in layaway right about now. You ought to be tucking away some praise so that when the storm comes, it won't catch you off guard. He says they have a particular routine, but, but, but he says the reason we don't trip is because they have a promising result. It's in the text. You can follow with me. He says this is what you got to know. He says you need to know going in that your test is never just because God ain't got nothing to do. You see, the, the ancient Greeks, when they talked about their gods, their gods would play tricks on the human beings. They're, they're, it, it was the way that they had fallen. But, but God is not about the business of letting us have tests so he can play tricks on us. God just doesn't let us have tricks. And, and if you're like me, I used to think that the only time God would test me is when I would mess up. I'm, I, I don't need everybody, but I just need some of God's folk who's messed up. Who, who, who when you messed up, you, you start getting ready for God to get you. You start walking slow. You start, come on, talk to me. You messed up, you were looking for God to get you. But, but, but let me just drop this in. I don't need everybody, but let me tell you what God will do. I need somebody here to testify that God has messed you up more with mercy than he did with judgment. You messed up and you were waiting on God to get you, but instead of beating you, God blessed you and it made you... Uh, uh, you. So God says, I'm not just going to get you. He says, sometimes when you're waiting to get you beaten, I'll send a blessing and it'll scare you in the line. I, I, I got any folk in here who've been scared in the line by, by God's goodness. Sometimes God is just so good, I, I start acting better. Well, that's just me. You, well, well, listen to what he says here. He says here, he, he says that here's the promising result. God says, when I take you through tests, I'm not playing tricks with you. I'm not always punishing you. God says, I am developing something in you. God says, he is what I want to do. I am developing patience in you so that it can have a perfect work because what I'm doing is I'm perfecting you. The difference between a lump of coal and a diamond is that a diamond is coal that's been in under pressure for a long amount of time. And God says, what I'm doing in you is I'm letting patience have a work in you because I am developing you and you can't rush the work that I'm doing. I am literally making you priceless. What I'm doing in you is I'm developing you so that you can have patience. You can have this word endurance literally means it. The term literally in the Greek means heroic endurance. God says what I'm doing for you now is I'm teaching you how to be an example to somebody else. God says you think I'm mad at you? No. I'm trusting you to suffer for me because I'm working something out in you. you. I'm not mad at you. I pick you because there's some folk I could trust with the stage, but I can't trust them to suffer. If I gave them the stage, they'd sing all over here. But if I let them suffer, they'd deny me. So I'm trusting you to suffer. And here's what I'm doing with you. God said for you to quit on me because you're going through is like you looking at a box of cake mix and said, I don't like the way it tastes. You ought not like, I'm not finished with it yet. God says, I've got to mix some stuff up. I've got to put you in the fire. And whenever anybody wants to write you off because of how you look now, you got to tell them, I'm under construction. God is working on me. Now, 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 you can't, you can't look at, do folks still make cake from boxes? I, I, I don't want to know about this. My wife bakes at Tom Thumb. But, but no, 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 no. I just tell you, I didn't marry her for a cake. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so, 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 so what, what, this, is what, this is what James says. James says that patience, J, James says, here is the thing. He's writing to some people. This word, diaspora. In the first century, this, this letter takes place about A.D. 64. In the first century, there were two great persecutions. There was the Domitian persecution and the Neronian persecution. He said that the Christians went through some things like, y'all, if, if we had to go through some of the stuff they went through, we, we would have quit a long time ago. 
They, they were forced to say that Caesar was Lord, and if they said Jesus was Lord, they would be taken out. Some were killed on the spot. Some were dipped in oil and burned as lights. Some would be wrapped in animal skins and forced to fight tigers and lions. Some would be tied by their limbs to horses, and they would hit the horse and pull them apart. Some would be buried up to their neck and they were used almost like polo, like they playing polo right about. And when he writes to them, he says, I know you're ready to quit. I know some of you thought Jesus would be back before you finished. He says, but here's what I want you to do. Let God finish working in you because what God will do is he says, God has already worked for us. So what God will do is God, when after God has worked for you, he'll start to work in you. And when God works in you, he'll start start to work through you. And he says, you can't get to the end until you go through this. There's no way to bypass it. And I stopped by to tell somebody tonight, you thought God is, was mad at you? God said, no, I'm developing you. God is no more mad at you than a coach is who teaches his players the plays because what God says is, I know it's rough. I'm going to stretch your muscles and they're going to be sore. But God says, when I get through with you, he says, you're going to be fully mature. God says, I'm teaching you right now how to lift the weight of suffering. I, I'm lifting the weight of struggle. I'm lifting the weight of sickness. But you get ready because your boy is about to blow up. When God takes me through what he's taking me through, I'm going to be cut for the kingdom. And don't you quit on me. I'm developing you. My, my, my big mama, my, 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 maternal grand, my, my paternal grandmother would make biscuits. And, and uh, when, when she would make biscuits, she would put stuff in the biscuits that I would, I don't like buttermilk, but she put it in the biscuit. I wouldn't eat flour by itself, but she put it in. I don't, and, and I'm from the country, so I, I wouldn't eat a pinch of salt, but she put it, but she put it in biscuits. Now here's what, I, I wouldn't eat butter by itself, but she put it in you know what, she, she, I, I would ask her, Big Mama, why are you doing that? And, and she could have spoken to me in anger, but you know what my Big Mama would say? She said, baby, I've done this before. What I didn't understand is Big Mama had a recipe. And Big Mama said, I, I've done this before. And what I would do is Big Mama would mix all the ingredients together and put it in the fire. And when it came out, I'd be the first one to grab some. And come on, somebody here know. Don't make me mention bread rabbit or delta syrup. Don't make me go there. And what God says to you is you need to quit trying to take individual things out of your life saying, I don't like that by itself. God said, I'm not going to give it to you by, you by itself. God said, my promise to you was not that everything is going to be good to you, but I promise you that everything is going to work together for the good. So don't try to judge me by one thing. Let me put it. I wish I had some folk in here who can say, I'm on the waiting for the together train. It ain't together right now, but God's going to work it out for my good. And when God gets through, I like what James says. He says, he says count it all joy. When you fall into diverse temptations, and, and he says, let it have its perfect work in you. Listen to what he says. He says that there's a promising result. He gives us uh, a particular routine. But then he says, let me give you the proper response. How do you handle? I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't live in some ivory tower. I'm human. I, I know about struggling. I know about pain. I, I know about heartache. What, what do you do? I'm, I'm glad you asked. James says now, I'm not going to give you some imaginary answer. I'm not going to pretend like, oh, everything is going to be honky-dory. He says, now, the first thing you got to understand is that the Christian journey is not like Burger King. You can't have it your way here. He says, you got to persevere. You, 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 you just got to go through. I'm not, I'm not here to sell you any idea that, oh, if you have a Christian life, you're going to play. Listen, I think one of the reasons why people become so frustrated with our faith and with their faith, because we keep telling this foolishness about that if you become a Christian, that you won't have any struggles. You Listen, that's a lie. 
anybody you find telling you that now it ain't about how much faith you have. Listen, the whole Christian faith is built up on a crucifix. We built up on a cross. That's suffering. You, and, and to be honest with you, some stuff you just got to go through. And Christians need to grow up and quit wanting stuff to be easy. Everything in life I've ever had worth having, I had to go. He says some stuff you just have to go through. You can't evade it. Some stuff you can't explain away. Some stuff you can't escape. You just got to go through. Man up. Be a big girl. And say, I'm going through. I, I started. And let me tell you, whenever you get ready to talk about, oh, how bad it is for you, let, 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 let your boy holler at you. Let, let, let me tell you about a partner I had and what he went through. He was seated at the right hand of God. Yeah, I had a friend who was at the right hand of God, and, and, and all he had to do was let angels come by and praise him all day long. But, 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 but when his father needed somebody, the old preacher where I'm from said he stepped on a four, train that went through 42 generations. He said, Dad, if you make me a body, I'll go down. And he passed the praise of angels by. Now, now let me tell you about his life before you start complaining about what you're going through. Let me tell you about him. They didn't even have room for him, not in the hospital, but the hotel didn't have room. He had to be buried out there. With the, he had created all of creation, had to be buried out where they fed the animals. He was born running for his life. When he was 13, his mama and daddy forgot him at church for two days, and then they came back together. He got up, started doing good, and he had a group of 12. One of them betrayed him. The other 11 ran off and left him. They took him one Friday evening. They put nails in his hands. They put spikes in his feet. They put thorns on his head. And you want to tell me what you're going through? But let me tell you how he handled it every Sunday morning. Now, now, so, 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 so you got to persevere. But that ain't all you can do. Let, let, me tell you, let me tell you what else you can do. I, I, I like what he does here. Not, not only must you persevere, but there's another response. He says you got to pray. It's, it's in the text. He said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who giveth all things liberal. He says to this now, he says that when you're going through, you got to learn how to pray. You know the problem with many of us? That we spend so much time talking to other folk about stuff that only God can fix. I know you tweeted it, but did you pray about it? I, I know it was on Instagram. I know it was on Facebook, but did you pray about it? And see, the problem is that when you put your business on Instagram and Facebook, folk who are looking at you can't handle it because there are some folk who are concerned about your business, don't care about your circumstances. Preach, Delvin Atchison, and I am. But I need to tell you that you need to talk to God about your situation. You, you need to turn off your phone and get off your computer and go on your knees because when you learn how to pray about it, God can fix some stuff. I wish I had about four people in here who will help me testify that there's some stuff I prayed about. And when I prayed about it, if God didn't make the load lighter, he made my back stronger. The senior pastor I used to know used to say that whenever his father, his, that his father had a team of mules and, and whenever the team of mules got in a situation where it was too, when something would get bogged down, if they couldn't handle it, he'd tell him, go get, your dad, go get my brother's oxen. And he'd go get his brother's team of oxen. And he said the difference was that when the load got heavy, the, mule, the mule's knees would buckle. But when the load got heavy on the oxen, on the oxen they would bend their knees and dig in. Now, you got to decide whether your knees are going to buckle or bend. When, I wish I had so I, I just slipped that right in there. You've you, you got to decide that when things get difficult for you, if you're going to fall apart or if you're going to go on your knees. And I know God already knows, but he needs you to tell him about it. And let me tell you why he needs you to tell him about it. He needs you to tell him about it so you will acknowledge that, it's, that he's the only one who can do something about it. I, I, I wish I had somebody here. And I need to tell you that the good thing about telling God about it, I, I, just, I just found my niche right there. My, I got happy thinking about it. The good thing about telling God about it is you don't have to have a special code. When you want to tell God about it, you don't have to have in, any kind of special equipment. I, I heard my big mama say, I got a phone in my bosom. And he, she said, Jesus is on the main line. I don't need everybody, but I wish I had somebody who knows you can tell him what you want. Good thing about prayer is you don't have to wait for certain hours. Good thing about prayer is you don't have to wait for the store to open. You can call him in the morning. 
You, you can call him at noonday. You, you can call him in the evening. You, you can call him at midnight. You, you can talk to him. I wish I had somebody who can testify that you don't have to have a special language. You can just tell him what's on your heart. Jesus is on the main line. But then James says, not only should you pray, but James says we ought to praise. Because James would tell us that when we're going through, you got to persevere. He says you need to learn how to pray, but then James says you ought to learn how to praise. And I need to tell you that if the only time you can worship God is when things are going well, you don't have a real praise. I wish I had some folk in here who would testify that I know what it's like to praise him when things are going bad. Because when you learn how to praise him when things are going bad, it's amazing how God can transform your situation. Is there anybody in here who testified that God can turn a waiting room into a sanctuary? I dare you just to praise God for what you're going through. I, I dare you to learn how to count. I'm on my way to my seat, but I need to tell you a story about D.E. King. He said in 1978, he went back to his alma mater, Le Mans College. And he said that the president there, President Franklin, was calling out names as he was the guest speaker. He said, and when he got to a particular name, there was a lady who just started hollering way over in the back, nobody but Jesus. He said when the president sit down, he asked her about that lady and the president said that that was a lady who was raising her granddaughter. She didn't have enough money and almost every week she would call to see if a baby could stay in school. And he said somehow God had fixed it so that every semester there was just enough money to keep her in school. So that when she graduated, her grandmother said, nobody but Jesus. King said, he told the president, I wish you would have told me before she graduated. Because I would have got up with her and said, nobody but Jesus. I wish I had a nobody but Jesus testimony in him. That there's some stuff you went through, you can give your doctor credit. Some stuff you went through, you can thank your bank up. But some stuff you've been through, nobody but Jesus. Nobody but Jesus. Who can love me like he can? Who can heal me like he can? Who can hold me like he can? Who walks with me? Nobody but Jesus. Is there anybody here who loves my Jesus? Is there anybody here who loves my Lord? Ain't he alright? Ain't he alright? Ain't he alright? When I think about where the Lord has brought me from, Nobody but Jesus. When I think about the little money I got in my pocket, nobody but Jesus. When I think about a nappy-headed boy from her Texas standing at Carnegie Hall, studying at Oxford, studying in the Vatican, nobody. Nobody, nobody, nobody. I got to preach two more times this week. So I was trying to save this, but I'm going to go and get it out. I know he's all right. I know he's all right. If the Lord's been good to you, you ought to help me close this 
servant If he's been good to you Why don't you help me close this sermon If you know he's alright Why don't you help me close this sermon Can you help me say I'm learning how to count when I'm in sickness, that's joy. When I got money, that's joy. But when I'm broke, that's joy. If my body is well, that's joy. If I'm sick, that's joy. If I'm standing in the palace, that's joy. But if I'm at the funeral home, that's joy. Joy! Joy! very much for worshiping with us and for your continued financial support. We look forward to you joining us on next Sunday. Have a blessed week and remember who gave it to you.